So hi uh, everyone, we've got Sara Webb today with us on the third episode of the Money Master HQ uh, show. And uh, Sara, how are you doing today and where are you joining us from? Yes, I'm doing well. I am in Fort Worth, Texas. Great. How's the weather like today? It's going to be between 86 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's going to be warm as we're kind of heading into the late spring and early summer for us here, but not too terrible. Okay. We're heading into summer as well in Dubai, but uh, we've just had some record-breaking rain yesterday and uh, quite a have been flooded as well as a result. Now, Sarah, how would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Yes, I'm a fractional CFO, so I help small businesses with their day-to-day accounting, cash management, and forecasting. So we fit in a niche where someone is not ready for a full-time CFO, but they need a higher-level strategist, and that's where we work with you know, their existing accounting team or even our team can handle the day-to-day, and you know, I'm in there helping really develop the finance strategy of the organization. Nice. How did you get to this uh... This thought of, you know, being a fractional CFO rather than a full-time CFO, what really motivated you? Yeah, I just needed, for me personally, I needed flexibility. So I worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers for several years in their tax department. And then I worked at Novartis for about 10 years after that. And working with large corporations or having an employer, you're kind of always on the clock for them. And so for me, after I uh, Novartis, I was the CFO for a family owned business and I really liked that. And that was kind of the first taste of small business accounting. And it's, I don't want to say it's more important than corporate accounting, but as a small business accountant, you are making payroll the next week, right? Like when you work for a large fortune, 100 company, you're not worried if you're going to be able to pay everyone the next week. And so working with smaller businesses, really got into the nitty gritty of their cash management and helping them make decisions. And when I finished that role, I said, you know, there's other companies or businesses like theirs that don't really need someone full time, but they need this level of support. You know, they have bankers or they have loans or they're struggling with their cash. And so that was really how I sought out not to fill out my own personal well-being of not working in corporate, but also seeing the spot of how I could help other small businesses for sure. How would a small business benefit from such services of a fractional CFO? Yeah. So a lot of times uh, small businesses have a day-to-day bookkeeper. This is a person who's just recording the transactions as they come in. So they're always looking in the rearview mirror of what has happened. A CFO is a forward-looking person. So, of course, we have to have the data to – we have to have the historical data to help inform decision-making. But what are we going to do with that information? And so I work to help set a budget for the next year, um, have discussions if we need to make modifications to our – our spending plan, or you're saying, oh, I want to invest in another sales rep. Can I afford to do that? Right. We'll help you with that calculation. And then if that sales rep is hired, we're going to show you how you're profiting from them. So it's really a forward thinking discussion um, that you're not really having with your bookkeeper or day to day accountant. And that's okay. We have to have those individuals doing those jobs because we rely on that data, but we're all about okay, so now what? This is what you did, so now what are we going to do differently or change in the future to to drive even greater results? Thank you for that. And I think that's something that you always talk about. I've I've heard you speak about the future, looking at the future rather than just the past. And I think accountants are mostly stuck with looking at the past numbers, the past performance, the past profits and losses. You know, what did we do last year, last month? But why is it so important as a business owner or a small business owner, to be more precise, uh, to look at that future, future aspect, and how would one go about it? Yeah, well, let's just take my very first job when I prepared tax returns. So it's April 2024. Um, That tax preparer is working on your 2023 results. I can't do anything to impact them. Like, we can't come up with some crazy tax strategy. We can't come up with anything inventive. We're locked. We're locked out of that period. That 2023 is done. So all that person is doing is recording what has already happened. I want to focus on, yes, we have to know what happened, but what are we doing differently? What are we doing next? 
And so bringing the accounting and the numbers to have help business owners dream and plan for the what if. What if we did this? What could we do? What if we made a change in some somehow how we're operating? What if we invested in a certain marketing program? How is that going to drive greater results? And so looking at, okay, acknowledging and respecting what's been done, because that like you that's your foundation. But how are we going to do something differently to drive even greater results? That's that's a good answer, I guess. And I think uh, it's important, as you say, to look at the future. And nothing much can be done in terms of the concluded tax year. And, uh, I mean, as you say, unless you do some creative accounting, which in most cases, you know, could get you into trouble, it's always important to look into the future. So having worked with a number of small businesses, small business owners, you know, what are some of the common pitfalls do you think or do you've experienced that uh, small business owners fall into and how could they come over them? Yeah, I see one of the biggest challenges is if they have a bookkeeper or maybe a tax preparer or a financial person in their life, they really abdicate all the finances to that person. Right. So you're just assuming that things are getting paid on time. You're assuming your collections are happening and maybe you're not really studying the reports they're sending you each month. Um, just because you have a team member that helps you in that department doesn't mean that that they're even the best person or they. It, it's not their responsibility to make sure that your financial results are performing the way that they are. It's your responsibility as the business owner. So I see a lot of. Practitioners and small businesses saying like, oh, I have an accountant who helps me. It must be going well without really diving into the numbers and seeing how it works for themselves. They're, I think sometimes they're a little too trusting. And I don't mean in like a fraudulent way. Um, there's a lot of just, you know, not understanding your numbers. And so then you're not understanding your customer or what's really a driver for your profit. Absolutely. Now, in terms of non-finance managers, uh, you know, there are a number of or majority of them are not aware of any of the financial concepts or tools. So do you think it's important for them to understand at least the key financial concepts and financial statements? And if so, what are some of those uh, statements and concepts that you think it's important for them to be familiar with? Yeah, I think if business owners want to make money, they have to have the basics of finance. So, you know, every single month they should get a profit and loss statement and look at that. We always look at it in a month over month view so that we can see things clearly in a column. And I mean, simple questions of like, hey, there was a number in January, February, and it's missing in March. What happened there? And as a business owner, you need to be asking those questions. And sometimes there's a legitimate answer, right? Like, oh, that bill did not come in or we got a discount. But looking at it and kind of understanding how you how your P&L flows on a month to month basis is critical. Uh, also at challenge business owners, we, the balance sheet is not sexy. Nobody, everybody all revenue, net income, but you do need to be looking at your balance sheet. Do you have enough cash reserves to handle the upcoming, you know, month or two? Uh, did your AR, did your accounts receivable, did it increase or did, were you better at collections? You know, that is cash is the life um, line of your business. Um, and then, Third, I, I do, for some of our clients, they need to look at that cash flow statement. If you've ever asked yourself, like, I feel like I'm making money, but I don't know where anything goes, like why why I feel so poor, I guarantee you it's in your cash flow statement. Um, so if you're not able to pay yourself or you're like, I'm I'm working so hard and I'm making more than ever, but I have nothing to show for it, that answer is on your cash flow statement. Especially for a business that's growing rapidly, you know, there could be good profits, but cash flows could be a, a negative month on month. So yes, lots of, lots of business owners get concerned that they have good profits in their P&L, but don't necessarily have uh, a cash flow to correspond to. And they're difficult to understand that, that difference. So yes, it's, it's really important that they understand some of these statements. Now, in terms of, Accounting and technology, I think this is a vastly spoken area, particularly with the advent of chat GPT and AI and so many of these tools that have come over, come uh, through over the recent past. So do you think it's important for small businesses to be in line with the latest technology? Yes or no? And what are some of the technologies that you think, uh, you know, could be useful for a small business? Yeah, I don't see a lot of space for small business. Um, 
owners to be the innovator, right? So if you talk about the technology curve, um, I'm, I would say be a late person, maybe even a little bit of a laggard in the, if you're a small business owner, because one, you, you just don't have the funds unless you're in the technology space and you're trying to create something. It's really better to let other people kind of troubleshoot some of these. So I think there's definitely uses for small businesses to use machine learning and to use AI. Um, but you don't have to be an innovator to do that. Let some other larger companies, let even some competitors get a little bit ahead of you if you're not going to take the time to invest and be creative in that space. Um, an easy example, like QuickBooks uses AI, right? Like they're using AI how you're matching your bank transactions and they're giving you recommendations. And I think that's great. I didn't need to invent that myself. It makes my job easier and I'm using some of the mainstream tools to make my job easier, but I don't have to be the first person to figure this out. And I don't have to be at the forefront of this, especially if it's not your business. If you're in professional services or you're in some type of brick and mortar business um, there's definitely uses for AI and machine learning, but you don't have unless you're wanting to invest and be in that space, you get to your competitive advantage significantly. You, it's OK to let a few other people go first. You can be right behind them and let them say, OK, here's what I've troubleshooted. Here's what we're using. Um, I see so many people try out new technologies and then they're abandoned in three to six months because they were you were in the beta and you didn't know that for for the company that was testing their software when they're first launching it. And yes, there are thousands of those, right? I mean, how many of them could you try out? So yes, why not let someone else try it? I mean, and learn from their mistakes and then do it better than them. So I think, yes, what you say makes a lot of sense, particularly for a small business owner where they can't afford to take, uh, you know, so much of risk at, at that point. Yeah. They, you don't have to, don't wait five years. That's not what I'm saying. Wait six months to 12 months. Yes. You don't have to wait too long as well. I mean, you, you'll be left behind, but yes, you yeah. need to just give it some time. Now, when it comes to small businesses, a majority of them are owned by families and family owned businesses, right? And even otherwise, now when it comes to small businesses, do you think it's important for, uh, for the business owners to separate their Personal and business finances, and uh, how how should uh, how should they approach uh, something like that? Yeah, well, in the United States, we do generally separate those things. So you have a set you have different legal entities for different types of taxation and structure. I do personally like for them to be separated. Um, it's it's great for legacy planning if you're planning to pass on the business to your children, or maybe you have two children and one is really interested in one type of business, and maybe you have someone interested in the other or you're planning differently for them. So I do encourage people to keep those separated. Um, for myself, I keep a set of accounting books for my personal finances because I want to know how I am performing of, you know, my business rolling up, but also my outside investments and 401ks and those things. So I, I love having multiple sets of books um, just so I can keep things easily separated and, and delineated. Now, when it comes to top strategies for personal financial success, for particularly for business owners and small business owners, what do you think they are? And uh, yes, what what strategies should should a, should an entrepreneur implement? Yeah, you need to know how to pay yourself. So your legal entity structure determines how you can pay yourself. Um, sometimes that's through distributions. Sometimes that's through payroll. And so if you don't understand the mechanism of your specific legal entity then you don't know how you're going to be taxed and you don't know how you should be receiving income. Um, I'm always a big proponent of maxing out any type of retirement planning available to you um, to reduce your tax. And so from a personal finance standpoint, you know, you, you've got to make sure that your small business earns enough money to pay for your lifestyle, for the, your basic necessities um, and try to minimize your tax liabilities as much as possible. Yeah, you talk a lot about, uh, you know, setups of organizations and the structures. Would you like to add something about it? And why do you think it's it's so important that an organization gets the structure right, right at the beginning? I think I've seen too many um, screw ups later down the road. So uh, if you're not seeking that advice at the beginning and telling them what your long term goals are, 
you could get to the end and either have a giant tax liability for some reason, or if you're planning some type of estate planning for for your legacy, that that may not happen how you anticipated it if you're not in the right legal entity structure. So um, I think it's all about having your end goal in mind. And sometimes even when you have the end goal in mind, it's it doesn't come out like you anticipate it to be right. So maybe you thought that you were going to go through an IPO. And so you set it up as a certain legal entity and five years in, you're like, an IPO is not viable. Okay. Now what do I need to do with this business? You know, is there an opportunity to wind the business down and restart it up in a, in a more tax advantageous um, legal entity? Possibly. Um, I think just a lot of times, especially in the United States, it's like, Hey, let's just start a business together and you don't have an agreement and you've written down on how you're going to behave or share all the money responsibilities. And it just gets really, really messy. Um, I feel like a divorce, a kid in a divorce sometimes when I'm trying to settle between two, uh, individuals and partnerships that don't have anything written down. That's true. Yes. Having that written agreements and the right structure is critical. And it's not only in the United States. I've seen it a number of times in, in separate jurisdictions as well, including Dubai, where I am. So that brings me on nicely to the next question, uh, Sarah. Now, when it comes to business owners and when they recruit their finance staff or accountants or even when they outsource it, how should they go about selecting that? particular employee to lead their finance function or when selecting an when selecting an external uh, external supplier how should they go about selecting such a uh, such a company yeah you want to look for someone who's got the right level of credentials that you need you in some cases you don't always need a cpa if you're just starting out or you're doing something really simple um, a qualified bookkeeper or accountant can be great. But as your company advances, you're probably going to need someone that has credentials or has experience in that space to help lead you through that next part of the journey. I would say how you like to communicate is the number one relationship indicator with you and your financial advisor. If someone is talking to you like they're reading from a textbook, that's not going to be very helpful to you. They may be the smartest person in, in whatever finance you're working on, but if they're not able to explain it to you and digest it for you in a way that's learnable, um, that's going to be difficult to, to partner with that person. Um, and on the flip side, you want someone that is invested in your business and that, that understands what you're going through, right? Being a business owner is hard. It's really hard. You generally have tire marks on your back where you've been run over by something, either, you know, something has happened and nothing goes according to plan. And so having someone who can be that trusted advisor to help walk you through those next steps. But I would say communication and credentials are some of the first things I would look for when selecting an advisor. And you believe that it's important for business owners to invest in their staff in terms of continuous education and training? Yeah, I think there's always room for that. I think we can always invest in our staff and helping get them to that next level. I think the staff, on the other hand, has to take some ownership, right? Like, what is it that they're wanting out of their own career? Um, but, yeah, I think there's always opportunity for us to learn something. I mean, even in the AI and machine learning space, right? Like, there's a there's probably lots of tutorials that we could take to enhance our skills and um, increase some of the usability that we already have out there. Yes, that's right. I think we are in a digital age where, you know, there's so much of content, probably information overload hasn't been uh, this bad, at, I think, any any time in the past. So, yes, there's so much of information just that we need to know with what information uh, to select and uh, process. Yeah. Now, when it comes to your services, let's talk a bit uh, about that. So you you did mention about budgeting, you did mention about the bookkeeping and accounting. What other services do you and and your company offer? You know, we're helping you establish that budget and that strategic plan over a three to five year period. Um, how we normally work with companies is we start with a profit assessment, and that is our kind of checklist and grading on where are you today, like what are your systems doing, how are you performing financially. And then you've told us this is your goal in three to five years. What does that roadmap look like to get you there? Because you're here today and you want to be somewhere better in the future. Do you have all the right staff in place? Do you have the systems in place? Do you have the strategy? Like when someone tells me, oh, I just want to grow 20 to 30 percent, 
okay, but like, how are you going to do that? Like, what is the tactical steps of what you're going to do? I mean, I can come up with math. I can tell you what that number is, but how are you really going to get there? And so we're that trusted business partner, definitely leaning towards the finance and accounting side of like, how is it going to happen? Um, but we're going to say, you know, that's not feasible. Like you're not going to get 10 X based on where you are today. Here are some things you can do to make your business better. That's going to make you more profit. And if you're interested in being acquired, it's going to make you more viable in the marketplace. Do you see the role of a CFO or a fractional CFO uh, changing anytime soon? Or do you, do, you, do you see it already changed over the last few years in terms of them being more strategic rather than just looking at the numbers and bookkeeping and accounting? Yeah, I think there's more professionals in the marketplace that are in this space. I think when it first started, it probably was more of just a controller role, right? Maybe you had an, a, a vacancy and you called up a fractional CFO. Hey, can you help me fill this role? And we were doing that type of work. I do see us more with the strategy arm. And your CFO has to be able to work with your banker, with your tax preparer. You know, it's a it's a partnership with other professionals that are serving you and the business. Okay. Now, talking about financial management, where do you see the future of financial management heading, at least in the next uh, five to ten years? I, I mean, we've seen so much of change over the last few months or even just the last one, two years, even uh, AI and chat GPT. But where do you see it uh, changing the most going forward? I think we're going to rely on individuals more for their expertise. So I think all the tools, the technology, the AI are going to help advisors like me do our jobs better. And it's going to allow us to get data and get information more fat, more easily, faster. You know, there's not going to be the cost to the cost to get that data and record that data is going to is going to lower. But like you said, there's so much data out there. You still have to have a partner that helps you parse out what is the important thing. So Maybe maybe AI takes over all of accounting and classifies classifies all our transactions. It still doesn't mean anything to you. You're not an accountant. You don't know what that means. You don't know what the core of that means. And you still need that translator to help you discern the information and decide the next steps. So I, I see for for management of financial data, I, I think we're going to be able to do even more with our clients because we have more information but that trusted relationship is going to be a lot more important and valuable because um, anybody can give you a P&L and balance sheet. Is it right? And and then what are the next steps for it? So I'm embracing the technology. I think it's fun. I think it is, if we can use it to make our jobs easier, I think that's great. I would be having conversations with business owners about their success and what we're doing next than pounding away at my computer, typing in transactions. That's that's not fun. That, that's not the glorious work of accounting and finance. I think it's a scary thought if AI is going to take over the role of the finance managers and accountants job, uh, but let's hope it doesn't, at least for the sake of our finance managers and accountants who are listening yeah. in this show. Now, coming into the risks of managing a business, particularly a small business, what do you think some of the largest risks are, like, some something that comes to mind is fraud. I mean, not not every employee is fraudulent, but end of the day, they, they, I mean, the statistics show that lots of small businesses have had some experience, whether it's online cybercrime or whether it's with it's some sort of fraud. So, how would a as a business owner approach uh, negating this kind of risk? Yeah. So we're always talking about the fraud triangle. So you have to have at least two, if not all three, items present. For fraud to occur. So one, you have to have like it has to be they have to be able to have access to the account or the information. Um, one is there's some type of pressure in this in in maybe their personal lives. Right. Um, as much as employers would like for us to be robots, we are people and we have outside pressures of all types. And then there has to be some type of rationale, like why you're doing that. Um, and from an accounting perspective, the one thing that we can do is put up controls. So segregation of duties is the number one control that you can have to prevent fraud, right? And so what is the person who prepares the data, prepares the check, is not also the check signer, 
right? So what happens in situations where there is fraud, someone has access to all the information and they're the only ones looking at it. And so as a business owner, you either need to create a workflow where you're signing off on the checks or you need to have another manager review someone else's work, right? So maybe one person prepares the ACH, the wire, the check, whatever it is, and then another person needs to approve it. It never needs to be the same person. Um, and as you're growing, you may not have that other person. And so that may need to be you sometimes. Do you have policies in place when you need to wire out or ACH money out of $10,000 or more? Maybe that needs to go through a second level of review. You know, putting those types of controls in place is the number one preventer for sure. I guess it's a balance between the control and and trust, right? I mean, too much of control wouldn't be good as well, and too much of trust without any controls isn't isn't great either, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, so my team, I don't commit fraud. I'm not out there doing that, but I have other people on my team do certain steps, and then I'm doing a different step so that it's a separation of who's performing um, the task. You don't want one person in charge of everything. But it's hard. As a, in the beginning, generally, it's you as the business owner. You don't have to co- put in controls for yourself. But, you know, adding those first few employees you need to be cognizant of that. Absolutely. How would a potential customer get in touch with you, Sarah? Uh, yeah. What are the social media handles? Yeah, we're all on all the social media handles as Web CFO, W-E-B-B. CFO, and that's our website too. So that shares a little bit about more about our team and what we're working on. Um, Instagram is my favorite uh, social media platform, but we're on um, LinkedIn and Facebook, but we're out there celebrating our clients. We're sharing information of things that we see in the marketplace that sometimes don't make sense to us. And so we'll say, hey, if you're doing this, you might need to reconsider it. Um, but we also give lots of uh, advice and opinions on what we see as best practices from our practice as well as what we're seeing happen in our customers because there's a lot of great things happening out there. Absolutely. So web CFO folks is the site. Now, thank you, Sarah. So just one last question that I thought, you know, could be important for a business owner is the mindset. I know you've come across a number of business owners who probably are stressed with their day-to-day issues and, uh, you know, so many concerns that, that take place, the changes that take place around them and the world. So why do you think it's important for a business owner to have a great mindset? And, uh, you know, how, how could they go about it? Yeah, I think entrepreneurs business owners are born with a certain mindset, right? Like you're not. You're not an entrepreneur or a small business owner because you want the status quo to happen, right? Like there's, you've seen a change or you've seen something in the marketplace that you can do better or more efficiently. And so mindset of the future potential or mindset of it can be bigger than this. Um, my dad used to always say to me, you can always make more money, right? You can always go out and do something else. You can always dream bigger. Um, and so I'm just more of a, I'm, I'm an optimist, right? Like I want good things to happen. Um, and I definitely see, you know, as mindset as an entrepreneur, it's you're like I said, you're tired, you're beat down sometimes, but there's something about like what you're serving or your mission or something that propels you to keep going. Um, because I think it's bigger than you. It's like hope for the best, but be prepared for the worst. <laughs> yes. And we all wear seat belts, right? Um, it's kind of like that. Any final thoughts, Sarah, before we end? No, no I, I appreciate you having me on the show. I know that your your audience is, you know, growing your they're growing their own businesses, right? They're you're they're doing some of the really hard. I think small businesses, we don't have giant budgets. We don't have giant marketing budgets. We can't just turn on the faucet of like all these employees running out there. And so the strategy for small businesses is so critical um, because we're working with limited resources in most cases. Yeah. So thank you very much, Sarah. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we've had an interesting discussion today. And if you're a small business owner, entrepreneur, or or, or thinking of starting your own business, I hope you've taken some useful tips from this session. And until we meet again, thank you very much and have a great day ahead. Bills keep piling up 
and your wallet's feeling light You're searching for a way to make it all right Unsure of where to turn or what to do MoneyMasterHQ.com has got the tools for you Empower your life with financial success Through education, expert guidance, we're the best MoneyMasterHQ.com will show you the way To reach your goals and make your dream Dive into a world where dreams are wealth aligned with Money Master AQ, watch your fortune shine. Cash in on knowledge, let wisdom be your guide. In the realms of finance, with us you'll strike. Yeah, yeah. Million dollar mindset is what we instill. At MoneyMasterU.com, I'm the financial hill. Empower your journey, with wisdom you'll present. to brilliance our book leads the way accounting fundamentals making finance play for managers for dreamers the numbers we trust with our guidance success is a must yeah hey to your street piling up and you always feeling light you're searching for a way to make it all right i'm sure of where to turn on MoneyMasterHQ.com has got the tools for you Empower your life with financial success, oh yeah Through education, expert guidance, we're the best MoneyMasterHQ.com will show you the way To reach your goals and make your dreams stay